What's going on, everybody? It is Triple Crown 24 back with you today. I'm peeling back the curtain a little bit and showing you some of my listing practices that I use to sell sports cards on eBay. Now, I do this full time, and some of what I'll say today just won't apply if you're someone who's looking to sell at a lower volume. If you're someone who's just curious as to how I do it, well, I hope that you're entertained by today's video. But if you're looking to use this video for educational or informational purposes, I'm hoping that there's at least one thing that you can take away from this in order to improve your efficiency with listing, regardless of the volume that you sell at. One final thing I'll address, the elephant in the room. Yes, I am wearing glasses. My vision is fine. These are uh, special blue light glasses to kind of protect my eyes because I sit at the computer a lot working. So just wanted to go ahead and address that since most people who watch the channel regularly are not used to seeing that. So little introduction on why this video is being put out today is that one of the most common questions that I get from those who know what I do and I tell them kind of what size my business is at right now is, wow, how do you keep up with that many cards? How do you even list that many cards? I get that question a lot. And really, I would say the maintaining aspect has become easier as time has gone on and I've found ways to make it more efficient. The listing undoubtedly is something that has taken quite a bit of time to get done. And to get to 36,000 listings is something that, quite frankly, unless you have a large team operating under you, will not happen overnight. It's a lot of long hours. It's a lot of grinding to get to this point. But if you keep at it, regardless of what volume you want to sell at, you can easily see the size of your store grow. And you don't need to have 35,000 listings to have a successful eBay business or even a side hustle that may fund your hobby. I just want to put that out there. You know, you don't have to do it exactly as I do. And there are probably ways that you'll think of when you're watching this video to do it even better than I do. And I would love to hear from you in the comments if you have suggestions for how I can improve things too, because I've value learning about these things as well. A lot of what I'm going to say today has been through trial and error. So there are two camps to really discuss here today. There's the camp of how do you get so many listings in your store and how do you maintain so many listings in your store? So we'll start with the former is how many, how do I get so many listings? Well, I use a program that was formerly known as file exchange. And if you've heard of this before, you're not alone. I have a lot of people who say they've heard of this or maybe seen something about this, but they just don't understand exactly how it works or what it even is. Now it's called reports or up. it's through the upload reports tab through your eBay seller hub. So it's a little bit different, but it is still essentially the same thing being file exchange. So let me go ahead and stop sharing my eBay store really quickly. And I apologize for the boxes in the background. I'm currently building a sale for whatnot right now. So uh, there is some boxes all over the place. So I need to finish adjusting that. But I'm going to go ahead and share with you my template for file exchange. So what this is, is a program through eBay that uses what's called a CSV file, standing for comma separated values to bulk upload listings. How CSV files work is that they, as I said, standing for comma separated value, will take these Excel spreadsheets or really any spreadsheet program or similar thing. You know, there's, I think numbers is what it's called on the, uh, on Mac or uh, Google Sheets, whatever the case may be. They use those and uh, convert them to what is basically a string of text where the values or the information, so to speak, is separated by commas so that when it is input into a site, it knows where to populate the information that you give. So I'll give you an example right here. You can see here, uh, say that I was going to upload this file to eBay here. So what it will do is it will take each line and it will read it. So here it says action add. So it knows that I want to make a new listing. This is custom label here. So this is my SKU number that I use. I'll talk about those more in a minute. If you have something else that you want to put there, you can also put it there as well. My category here, this is trading card singles. eBay has a whole guide on their website. I highly recommend checking that out. That will give you the category codes. The reason that I have this populated already is because I'm only using this to list sports trading card singles. So that's why I have that there. Condition is always used for these. Um, 
So that's why I have that 3000 there. That is the item condition code for that. Uh, as you can see right here, graded, I did not use uh, this program to sell graded cards. I prefer to list those manually. So I always have that listed as no. Same thing here with card condition. If I need to change it from near mint, if it's not in great shape, I can do that. But for the most most part, excuse me, most of the cards I'm going to be selling, I'm going to classify as near mint. And you can see some of the various things that I have here. Uh, picture URL. This is the one that is most interesting if you're looking to use this for yourself. So the way that I do this is that I use Image Shack to create direct image links to my photos to go ahead and or to my cards. And then I'll take those links to the photos for the cards and I will paste them into here. And I can bulk paste them all at once as I upload them to Image Shack. So there are a few pros and cons to that, of course. Uh, number one is that you can upload all of your images very quickly using this. What are the cons? Well, there's several. Number one, if you like to have multiple images, it's not as easy to create an image gallery. Uh, personally, I don't even know how to do it. I am sure that there's a way, but I only upload one image of the card. Typically, I'm only selling cards under $10 when I'm doing it this way. Very rarely am I going to sell anything more. And if it's any more, the most it's ever going to be is $20. Anything else, I do like to just go ahead and manually list that to assure that it is done to the exact liking. Um, so I'm not just doing it in bulk to save time. But regardless, uh, multiple images can be very challenging with that. Another thing too is that if you go into edit your listing, you are not able to edit the photo. So what I have to do if I want to edit my photo is take a screen capture, save the screen capture, and then upload it uh, in place of the photo there. So not as easy to edit the photos in there. You can typically only have one. Also, when you upload to Image Shack, for whatever reason, sometimes the photos may not upload in the same order that you attempt to upload them or in the order that you took them in for your listing. So that can also present a bit of a problem. What I have to do is I have to double check the order right before I go ahead and list stuff. So it's not something that takes too much time, but it is something that does add a little bit of time to this. And the whole purpose of this exercise here is to cut down on that time. However, uh, significant to the duration may be, this is about saving time and maximizing your efficiency. So. It is something to consider there. Uh, but you can see everything else here, my description, my starting price, all of my shipping information there, my shipping discounts, my return policy, uh, my combined shipping rules, all of that is listed here. So that is how I go ahead and upload them. Now, how fast can I do it? Well, I've gotten used to doing this now. So for me, I can usually list a card once every 30 seconds worth of time using this method. If it's something that requires a lot of attention to detail or a set that I'm just not as familiar with, well, then it may be a card a minute. Now, if it is a card that I'm very familiar with where I'm listing a bunch of cards from the same set, that's when I can start to do three to four cards in a minute. And you'll see me sometimes where I'll be able to upload 80 to 100 cards within the span of about 15 to 20 minutes. And that's when you really start to get rolling. So. How do I do that? Maybe your question. Well, it's about listing the same types of cards. And unless you're doing something the way that I'm doing it here, where I'm listing in this much quantity, it may be very difficult for you to do that. But this, this could still be applicable. Uh, I used to do, and I still do to some extent, open quite a bit of new sealed product in order to integrate it into the store, or I will buy uh, people's results from their own box breaks or group breaks and then buy those cards on the secondary market to then add to my store in order to get the latest cards in there. So when that happens, let's say for example, I have the new 2022 Topps Series 1 Baseball, or at least it's new at the time of release. Well, if I go ahead and edit this right here, all of my cards that I'm about to upload, we're gonna say I'm gonna upload 100 here because I have 100 lines worth of uh, file exchange uh, information here. I can just hit baseball and then double click here with this little black plus sign, and that will auto populate baseball for the entire listing there uh, for sports. So now all of my listings of sport will be baseball. I'm selling top series one, so the manufacturer is gonna be tops. Again, pretty easy to do there. 
Uh, same thing here with the price. Let's say I'm selling all base cards and I'm gonna sell them at 99 cents. Well, I change that down to 99 cents, click down. Now all of these listings here are 99 cents. So all of a sudden I have all of that taken care of here. Now let's talk about some of these other categories that may have to add such as title, the player, and the team. So this may take a while. So let's say for example, uh, card number one in the set, I believe is Shohei Otani. So let's say I'm gonna do Shohei Otani 2022 tops, number one. I usually put base in there. That's just the way that I like to format it. And then I put the team name Los Angeles Angels. I'll have to go in here, put Shohei Otani, and then put Los Angeles Angels. So not too bad. That listing is pretty much done at this point. Here's something else that I'll do if I have a lot of cards from the same set. I'll stop sharing that screen, but what I'll do is I'll go over to this one. This is something that I do in Google Sheets often because I'll have uh, people who work for me help me out with this just because it's something that's a little bit easier to do. Uh, this is what I'll use here. So as you'll see, I have this Google Sheets file open and that's why I said that earlier is because this is something where uh, it will update live. You can see the last time I updated this was just over a half hour ago. And it will show you um, that I have this card name here. So this is how I auto populate my card names. If you look up into our formula bar, it may be a little bit difficult to see even if I go full screen here. But to give you an idea at the top, you'll see all of these little cells and then all of these little blank spaces with quotations around them. So what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to put in a formula that will use the information that I provide in all of these cells that I have highlighted here in order to generate my title for me. And at the same time, I'm filling out my player name, my team name, and I'm also filling out my price and quantity information as I go along too. So you're kind of tackling multiple tasks at once, and then it's a pretty easy copy paste from there. So let's go back to this title cell. So I'm not gonna be editing this cell specifically. Uh, there's a few different ways to do this. This is the tab that I use most often in this little autofill spreadsheet I have. And you'll see here that it says equals B2 and, and then this blank space with quotation marks and D2, et cetera, et cetera. So what this will do is that this will produce a string of text based on the information that I've put in. So this is kind of like a puzzle that it puts together. So here we have B2, which is Braven Jordan in this case. So it will take the information that is in cell B2 and it plugs it into here. Then I have this right here. This is a just generic text that I typed in myself, which is a blank space. And that way it knows to put a space between Braven Jordan and 2022. If I take this out, for example, and I hit enter, now all of a sudden, excuse me, I should have said 2021, there is no space here between the two. So that is why I do that. Uh, now I don't have to set this up every time. This is something that I set up at the beginning and then all I have to do is copy it down. And you'll see here, it corresponds the number with the row here. So you don't need to anchor it or anything, uh, depending on how you set it up. But if you set it up like this, you wouldn't need to. Uh, I also have the team here. So you see C2 is at the end because I like to have my team last in the description. So C2, it reads this last and go ahead and puts it in. So all I have to do going along is what I normally do is I will move it over to the side. Let's say that I'm listing cards from the new set. So I have Shohei Otani. I have, he is on the Los Angeles Angels. It is 2022 tops, number one base. I can even do about if you wanted to top series one, number one base. And boom, now it has gone and changed that for me. Now I know that in this case, I'm going to be listing everything as 2022 tops series one, right? So I'm going to go ahead and drag this down. As you can see, it does want to change this here. So something that you may want to do uh, if you have numbers in the uh, description that you want to keep the same is to put in two and that way it will keep the numbers all the same. So now I went ahead and dragged this down. So all of my listings here, as you can see, have updated to the same product. So now I don't have to type that in 80 times. All the cards I'm going to be listing for the purpose of this exercise here is going to be base. So I go ahead and put that there. So now all I have is base. 
So really at this point, all I have to do is edit the player name, the team name, and the information. So again, I'm going to go ahead. I don't know who exactly aligns with what number, um, but let's just go ahead and put in a few examples. So we'll say Mike Trout is number two. And even if I'm doing this where all the cards are in order, for example, I can just go ahead and copy this down. Now, if you're opening up maybe just like one box or one blaster box of something, then you may not be able to do that. But that is just something that you uh, that you can do. So let's say that I can't do that. Let's say Mike Trout, I believe he's actually card 27 in the set. Man, I still edited it. It's number 27. But if they were in order, all I would have to do at that point would be to edit the player name and the team name. So let's keep going. Let's do Miguel Cabrera on the Detroit Tigers. Move it over. Number 343, that's what we'll call his card number. Let's go with uh, Francisco Lindor for the New York Mets. Card number nine. So you can see how quickly I'm going through and adjusting these at this point. And usually I'll do this all in one sitting. And uh, that way it increases, or excuse me, it decreases the amount of time that I have to go and click over and over and over like that. And you can format these in any order you want, as you can see here. Uh, I don't have these in alphabetical order. I have C at the very end. So if it's more uh, appeasing to you to move the team name so that you can just work linear, I totally get that. This is just what I've become used to. So that's the reason that I do it that way. So I know that part was a little bit long, but that is one of the tips that I use in terms of auto-populating titles is that if you have cards that are similar, if they're all going to be from the same manufacturer, if they're all the same parallel, like for example, there instead of base, if I had all tops golds, I could just put in gold or gold parallel there instead. So that is something that you can do to save yourself time again. It's just cutting down on that, and you may only be saving a couple seconds per listing, but it adds up very quickly when you're doing it in bulk, and that way you can knock those out very quickly. Let's move over to how I maintain what I'm doing. So, of course, to have that many cards, to be able to adjust them all in terms of price and stuff, I typically try to price things um, where I can adjust them. There's a way for me to tell what has been on the site longest. So uh, if you look at my page here on my seller dashboard, I have things defaulted to sort by title, but there are different ways I can sort it. For example, here, when I click to sort by watchers, what I can see is it will default to zero watchers. So nobody has any of these cards on their watch list. If I click it again, it will show me the cards I have with the most on their watch list. The one thing that you will notice here is that as I go through this, is that you'll see a lot of my oldest listings are going to be here as well. So typically what it will do is that it will default to the cards that have been listed in my store the longest. And the way that I can tell this as well now in hindsight is that these backgrounds that I have here are from when I very first started. I used to use this white uh, graded card box as well as uh, these little card stands here. And if you guys have seen my store in recent times, you'll see that it looks completely different. I also used to use maybe a generic beige color PSA box as well. So that is a way for me to tell what has been around for the longest amount of time. Uh, in addition to, you know, just looking over at the time left metric as well, which isn't always most accurate because my listings review, uh, renew after 30 days. And... Uh, you never know where it will be in the cycle. You know, I could have stuff that just renewed that was listed six months ago, or it could have been stuff that was listed, you know, 30 days ago, and it's just recycling for the first time. You just don't necessarily know unless you keep very extensive records. There are other ways to sort this here, but typically what I like to do is just by title. What I'll do is I'll go through every day. Uh, and know where I left off, and I will go ahead and adjust, you know, maybe 20 pages or so. I'll just go ahead and scroll down, see if there's something that needs adjusting in terms of price, in terms of title, to see if maybe I had a typo or something, and I do that. So I'm not necessarily reviewing all 718 pages of this a day. I just keep it to 20. That allows me to review a 1,000 listings. So nothing goes more than, let's say, on average, 45 days without being looked over at least once for any potential need to adjust pricing. Uh, most of what I sell anyways, I am moving it before a price adjustment is needed or it's only gonna be adjusted by a few cents. So 
it's not really something that is overly concerning for me a lot of the times, unless it is something that I price as a quote unquote day one price for a new release that I would need to adjust once the popularity of the product dies down. One thing that has been absolutely crucial for me in maintaining my store and keeping organization is using the custom label. This is by far and away what I would say is the best way to increase your efficiency because it's something that will eat up your time significantly if you are not organized. So getting all these cards listed up is great, but what happens after you list them? Where do you locate them? Where do you store them? And what is your process for getting those cards out once you sell them? It's not so hard if you only have 50 cards in your store and they fit all nicely into one little box. You could just go through your box. You only have 50 cards to go through. You go ahead and pull out the card. When you're dealing with 36,000 cards, it gets a little dicey, especially when you see the quantity here. That's just 36,000 unique listings. I'm a little bit below that right now. Yes, I know. But I have over 51,000 total items. So that includes cards that have multiple quantities like this one right here. This is total items. So as you can see here, when you have that many cards, it does present some challenges. So using the custom label is a way for me to quickly identify where cards are located and get them out quickly when they need to be shipped or when they need to be withdrawn for whatever reason or just for inventory purposes. Another reason behind this too is that if you do have someone who helps you, and I have people who help me, who do not know anything about sports, much less sports cards, this is a very good way for them to kind of communicate effectively with you. If you're talking about sports and they know nothing about sports, it's almost as if you were speaking a different language to them. Even me, sometimes I will mix up the parallels. You know, I'll, I'll say I'm looking for a prism with an S pair, uh, refractor, and really I'm looking for a sepia refractor. Just there's so many parallels out there in today's game that it's sometimes difficult to keep up with. So the SKU numbers allow me to easily identify which cards I'm supposed to be shipping out. It's also helpful if I have multiple of the same card from different consignees. I can tell whose card is who if they happen to send in the same card or if it's my card compared to theirs as well especially if the cards don't have a serial number where they are unique in that sense and can be easily identified. So keeping that in mind, what I use here is that I just use generic numbers. Some people will use alphanumeric codes, whatever works for you. And then I have the cards filed away by SKU numbers. So for example, the very first box that I have is SKU numbers one through 2000. If you open it up, uh, the very first card, Working through the four rows is number one. The last card is number 2,000. And everything else in between there that's not an autograph or a relic that I take the shows with me is put in there as well. Uh, how I used to do it, and if you're a smaller seller, this may work for you as well, as I used to do it by team and by player. The issue that you'll run into there is that I found a lot of times if I had a multiplayer card that there may not necessarily fit into, well, you know, whose category do you put it in? If I have, let's say, a Cal Ripken Jr. and Derek Jeter card, do I put that with the Cal Ripken Juniors or do I put it with the Derek Jeters? Does it go in the Yankees box or does it go in the Orioles box? One of those things that you have to think about. This is something that I found that makes it simple, where it doesn't matter what team they're on, it can even work for non-sports cards too, which I do sell. Uh, some of not as much, but there are situations that come up. For example, you can see the second one right there, Macho Man Randy Savage, that's a wrestling card, makes it easy. The one above that, in fact, the very first one is a heritage card that has no team with it. So I used to have a section just for heritage cards with no team, but what I found is that that section quickly piled up and I was still searching through hundreds of cards at a time to try to find the one I wanted. This allows everything to have its place and to be assigned in a very specific way. Now, I am doing this retroactively, adding these SKU numbers in. As you can see right there, the fourth one down on my screen doesn't have a SKU number assigned to it yet. As of recording right now, I have 20,100 SKU numbers assigned. Now, some of those have also sold, so I have quite a bit of a ways to go here with this, but it's something that I am chipping away at and I've really tried to tackle the cards where it is more necessary to do so. 
So how do I apply the skewed numbers? So what I will typically do is I will, let me go ahead and move myself here to the forefront, is I have these little stickers on the back of the penny sleeves. They're not on the cards themselves. I don't want to damage the cards, but they are on the penny sleeves. Now, I've only had one person ever complain about this. If they complain about this, I really don't know what to tell them. It's a penny sleeve, but this is a way that I can keep it efficient here. So you'll see I have SKU number and owner. This is something that I used to do because of consignees. Now I realize that the owner part is kind of redundant because I keep spreadsheets that show uh, whose cards they are. So it is not really necessary. Some of my newer labels you'll see here are just blank generic ones. Now, sometimes I will handwrite them in. Sometimes I will go ahead and print them out. Uh, typically, I've been printing them out lately, but if it's something where I need to use the same number twice because I have large quantities of one specific card, that's why I will choose to handwrite it, just because it is a little bit easier than trying to uh, populate this. So let me go ahead and share one more screen with you to show you how I use the labels. Let's go over here. So these are just generic Avery labels and I have no affiliation with Avery. I have no sponsorship deal. So this is just a pure endorsement for me. But personally, this is what I have found to be the most uh, effective labeling system for myself and one of the most affordable too. Uh, these little stickers may not seem like much, but when you're talking about 50,000 stickers, all of a sudden the cost will add up. So what I will do is I will buy the, I think they're the 8,000 packs. Um, if you're not doing this type of quantity, you can easily get by with a pack of maybe 3,200 or something along those lines. You can get them at any major retailer for very cheap. I would say that Walmart and Staples I have found have had the cheapest prices. Again, neither of those companies endorse me as well. So I'm just saying that because that has been where my experience has been the most positive is getting the deals there. So you'll see there, I have my logo there and then I have SKU number here as well. So the really cool thing is, is that if you wanna be able to handwrite it here, then you can just leave it blank. Let's say that I want to auto populate here. So I have this text file. What I can do is I can add what's called sequential numbers. So right now I am on number 20,100. Let's say I want to print five pages at a time. Well, I get 80 labels on one sheet, 80 times five, is 400 labels. So that would take me up to two or 20,500. So the first label I want, because I left off a number 100 is 101. The last one I want is number 500. I want to increase by one at a time. I hit add sequential numbers. And as you'll see, it auto populates where now all of my numbers are put in. So here's the very first one. If I click down here, here's 1,070, or excuse me, 20,179 just like I wanted it. So, and I can go through any of the five sheets I have here. I went ahead and put them all in for me. So now I don't have to handwrite all of them. So that is something where you, if you only have one quantity of the card, you may find it more beneficial to use it that way. And then from there, all I have to do is print. They're pretty easy um, to stick and seal. As you'll see here, they have these little perforations on the edges. So, if I fold this over, you'll kind of see this here, but the tops of them make it so that you can easily peel them off uh, so you don't have to you know, dig each one out. And it makes it more of a seamless process. So then I just put it off, put it across the back of the penny sleeve on the card. And from there, I have all my stuff labeled and ready to go skew wise Pulling cards out and having them organized is so crucial, I think, to its efficiency. And I mentioned that briefly earlier. The reason that I say that and the reason that I have really enjoyed doing it this way is that even for myself, I can identify the cards um, a little bit more easy because I'm the one who's listing them, right? I have to know what they are to even list them. I have to do the research on them if I'm not familiar with them. But still, it's easy for me to kind of just go through. And also, it helps with preventing mistakes. You know, sometimes, like I said, someone may buy a CPR refractor. I accidentally pull out the prism refractor because I got a lot on my mind. I'm not paying attention. That's a way to kind of check yourself is to have that SKU system down and to be able to use it where you can easily track your inventory. 
And other thing too is that if you're constantly digging through boxes looking for cards, that is wasting your valuable time searching for cards to ship out when you could be doing other things. You could be getting more shipments done. You could be getting more cards listed. You could be doing something else that's not even related to this, doing something that's not labor related. Uh, maybe you can go you know, buy some cards for yourself or do whatever you want to do. But this will free up your time because you will not have to spend that time digging things out. You know, it is very exciting to get your cards listed for sale and it's important to have them out to your audience. But what's even more important is being able to get them out to your customers quickly and efficiently. And you never want to lose a card, right? I've had it happen still under the system or maybe I misplaced a card or maybe I don't transfer it to the right box. Okay, it doesn't always eliminate the problem. But it has significantly cut down on the times where I've been unable to locate a card within a minute, say at most, from the time that I look on my screen here to go into the card room where I store everything, go into the box, pull the card out, and come sit back down right here. And a minute is being very generous with that time. It's probably even less than that. And sometimes if I have a lot of cards that are similar SKU numbers, I can just bring the box to my table here, go through them, pull them all out that I'm going to need to ship that day, and then put the box back. It's a much more efficient way to do it rather than having to sort through multiple boxes and kind of look for a needle in a haystack at times. So I hope that you found some of my tips here beneficial to you. I know that this was a longer video, but I wanted to be as thorough as possible. And as I said along the way, I don't have this perfect. I like to think that I have it down to a science that works for me. And hopefully some of these things that I say, if not all of them, will work for you as well. Are there ways to improve what I'm doing? Absolutely. You may disagree with how I do things as well, or you just don't like how I approach certain things. That's fine, too, because there's a lot of modifications you can make to adjust this to your liking or to cater whatever you may be selling, whether it's, you know, maybe TCG cards or something that is completely different in general. But I think that this can be beneficial, at least in some ways. So let me know in the comments down below what you thought of this. And if it helped you out, I greatly appreciate you spending the time to listen to me that, today. And I'm glad that uh, I achieved my goal of creating this video. So until next time, take care, stay safe, be kind.